Okay, so welcome everyone. So tonight we are on the next part of our Repel the Invasive series for this year. This time we are talking about multi-flora rows. Um, this particular invasive is kind of important to me as I've had the opportunity to assist local organizations with combating multi-flora rows. It's one of the more um, challenging invasive species to try to eradicate. It forms extremely dense thickets. It can spread very, very easily. Um, and of course, the sad thing is we intentionally introduced it in our country thinking it would be a good idea for an ornamental. So let's dive into this plant just a little bit here. So first, what I want to do is I want to go over the definition of an invasive species, because I know a lot of the folks who may be watching this, you have previous experience working with invasive species. Uh, but I like going over these definitions to kind of remind us so that way you all can help advocate to our communities why these plants are so important that we eradicate them out of our environments. So these species, we refer to them as invasive because they're outside of their natural range. Um, they don't belong here. Oftentimes we find them coming from places like Asia due to shipping habits which of course leads into the next part of invasive species is that we often bring them here ourselves. They don't travel here because of natural effects most of the time. Most invasive species have been introduced by humans, whether it's through us accidentally or unknowingly bringing them into our country or our particular range through shipping activities, or we sometimes introduce them ourselves, thinking they'll make a good crop or a good ornamental. Uh, the reason we dislike them so much is because since an invasive species is no longer in its native environment, it has no natural competition. So it's very capable of spreading everywhere. It will completely take over environments. Um, I'm actually going to show you some drone footage in a little bit that demonstrates uh, some of the work I've assisted with at one of our local state parks and how multiflora rose has overtaken environments at one of our state parks. So we kind of went over this a little bit already, but I want to focus a little extra on what an invasive species can do. I mentioned that it can outcompete native organisms. It has no natural competition. An invasive species will have no natural predators or herbivores. What they also tend to do is since they spread, they create a monocultural environment, which means just one living thing growing. And that in turn reduces the local biodiversity wherever it's spread. That lack of biodiversity will reduce the number of species we have, and it reduces the number of what are referred to as ecosystem services available to us. So if you in particular like certain flowers growing in your forest understory, or if you like certain kinds of insects that can be beneficial to like your garden, an invasive species will actually generate the effect where it's reducing those kinds of animals or plants in your vicinity. And of course, invaders can also represent a danger to us as humans. They can reduce the quality and yield of agricultural crops when they begin to take over farm fields or when they begin to invade pastures, things like that. So this picture, I love this. This was in my presentation on bush honeysuckle, uh, but I think this makes a great example. What you're looking at here is European dune grass, which has infested a dune area within the United States. And this picture was taken circa 1990. And essentially what you're looking at here is nothing but European dune grass. There are no other species here, not really in any kind of decent number that's going to have an impact. But watch what happens when people like you work to remove an invasive species from the environment. After several years, all of a sudden, the natural species begin to take back over and spread back into those areas. And you can see here that these dunes are now covered with endemic species that are beautiful, they're flowering, they're offering a diverse landscape and encouraging more biodiversity, offering those ecosystem services. And most likely in this area, it's probably also enhancing tourism because this is a dune, most likely it's near a beach or a waterway. So you, you're getting that extra tourism benefit too. And this is actually a very common story with a lot of invasives after they've been removed from an area. So of course, how do they get here? 
Now, right now, we're talking about multi-flora rows for the most part. So multi-flora rose has a particular story. And this story is actually shared by a few different invaders. And for those of you who are looking at this picture, I bet you can guess what I'm about to say. So like I said earlier, they're almost all entirely due to human activity. We bring them overseas, um, sometimes by accident, sometimes intentionally. When we bring them over intentionally, to me, this kind of represents our biggest heartbreak here because we get a plant that we think is going to be a huge benefit to us. We lose control of it. It begins to spread. And then the worst part is, is that a lot of folks don't realize that this plant is actually potentially damaging to the environment. They think it's still pretty and it's sold in stores. Um, that's why our recent terrestrial plant rule exists, but it still needs more work. There are a lot more species that need to get added to it. So for example, we have a few different plants that we're going to focus on here momentarily, but when they were introduced, what happened was we wanted them for one of two purposes. We wanted them to either provide us a crop that we could consume or use in some kind of product, or we wanted them here because they're pretty. We wanted new ornamental lines. And then that's when the problem begins. Like I said, they get out of our control. They begin to spread into our woods or onto our neighbor's properties. You may only see one or two bushes planted on a property, but unfortunately those bushes produce seed. Those birds will and animals will consume and move the seed around and they will spread much like this burning bush right here. Um, I cannot tell you the number of conversations I've had with people about burning bush and why they need to not plant this. Um, I have seen entire forest understories that have been turned bright red because this plant is now spread into them and has choked out other species because its ability to outcompete them. Um, another example that we have here are our calorie or, or Bradford pear trees. Um, I live in Terre Haute where calorie pear is very, very commonly planted. It was originally planted in an attempt to beautify the area. And I know several areas where this tree is now spread out of control. You can find several locations along highways now that have pretty white trees that are now taking over the area. Um, as much as calorie pear can be attractive, unfortunately, it is an invader. And we have been moving it around and planting it intentionally, and we are going to be paying a price for that. And this, of course, brings us to multiflora rows. Uh, this, this is the reason why I've been focusing on not species that have been accidentally brought here, but those that we have intentionally introduced, because multiflora rose is perhaps the poster child for this practice. This little rose comes from Japan, Korea, China, several areas throughout Asia. It was the rootstock was originally brought here circa 1866 because the person who brought it here wanted to generate a new rose line. This is not an uncommon practice. Even today, you'll find people who want to import different kinds of roses uh, to try to create new lines or move them around the, the country to try to create new ones. But unfortunately, in this case, it had a really, really terrible effect. When we started using multiflora rose, we started to plant it along highways to provide wildlife cover and to create erosion control. There's also some information you can find out there that stated that multiflora rose was planted to create a kind of crash barrier because it could grow so thick. If a car went through a guardrail or something, the multiflora rose could in theory reduce the speed of the vehicle and uh, mitigate the crash somewhat, which I mean, that in theory could happen. Yeah, multiflora rose can grow very, very thickly. But unfortunately, multiflora rose is very, very survivable. It thrives in areas with well-drained soils, which we have a lot of throughout this portion of Indiana. It likes to invade old fields, pastures, roadside areas, and forest understories that have openings. And uh, right now I'm sitting in Owen County in Spencer, and there are lots of those around here. Um, this area is covered with pastures. There are plenty of forest and hardwood areas that have developed and are intentionally developed here, as well as plenty of old fields and other types of areas. This little plant is extremely aggressive. It takes advantage of these fragmented habitats that we have, and it can spread by this concept referred to as layering of its individual canes. And we're gonna dive a little bit more into that in just a moment. 
So first, what I want to do is I want to start from the very start of life with this plant and go through the identification of it to try to help those of you who may not be as familiar with it. I'm guessing that a lot of people present on this call have probably seen multiflora rose in its more mature stages when it's blooming or maybe right before or right after it's bloomed when it's got really dense thickets of canes to it. Well, what I want to do is I want to show you all of its individual parts so you can take action earlier if you, if you can identify an infestation of this plant. So right now we're looking at the rose hips. This is a true rose. It does have rose hips. So it's going to produce rose hips that will last through the winter. They're this bright red color and typically balloon shape, just like in that picture. Each hip is going to produce seeds that can persist for more than 20 years in the soil. This is an extremely durable plant. And that means that any um, eradication practices must be done early and often. If you are dealing with an, a, an infestation right now, you're gonna be doing the work of years. There's just no way around that. But the sooner you get to it, the better. So let's take a look at the canes. Um, this is exactly the problem that a lot of us will see. And I have seen this in different areas uh, more times than I care to remember. It's going to form these incredibly dense canes. The canes can grow up to six to 13 feet in length. Um, and when the cane tips, when the stem tips begin to make contact with the soil, they are going to begin to root and it's actually going to become a brand new plant. And this process of rooting and becoming new plants and then stacking on top of one another in this dense thicket you just saw is referred to as layering. This is where the nightmare comes in with this plant because it's so dense that oftentimes heavy equipment struggles to get through this stuff. That's why we want you to take that action earlier. Now the blooms in this plant are probably the only good thing about it, at least they're pretty. It's going to have these really showy white or pink blossoms that are going to bloom May through June, which means this plant has leafed out fairly early. We're gonna cover that in a moment. The blooms stand out very easily and they're gonna be about one to two inches in diameter. So if you're walking through the woods and, or really a roadside or a pasture and you see these blooms, they're gonna stand out and you're gonna know that multiflora rose has infested this area. Now, as for the leaves, the leaves are a lot like many other roses. You're going to have pinnate leaves that are going to have a toothed edge. They're going to be um, alternately placed on the plant stem. This plant is going to also leaf out much earlier than most of the species that it's going to be competing with. And I have a great image I'm going to show you in a little bit on that. One of the easiest ways to identify multiflora rose, especially in hardwood areas, is the fact that it's going to be the first green thing other than bush honeysuckle that you're going to see. Um, those two plants are going to be greening up roughly close to each other. And thankfully, they look a lot different from each other, so you'll be able to separate them fairly easily. Multiflora rose leaves are going to have that toothed edge. They're literally going to look like a rose that you may have planted on your own property. It's just the canes are going to look a little bit different. So what I want to do now is I want to share with you some of the work that I've been assisting our local state parks with. The images that you're about to see and the footage are taken from uh, McCormick's Creek State Park right around April. Um, I'm a licensed drone pilot and I was asked by one of the naturalists at the park to use my drone to survey an area that was right next to the Wolf Cave Nature Preserve. The reason for this was because this area is infested with multiflora rose and they wanted an idea of how far it had spread. Now the picture you're looking at right now is one that I took and it's just a still image, but what I want you to focus on is notice the treetops. You can see that some of the trees are starting to green up, but several of them aren't yet. And then if you look past them, you can actually see the forest understory, the floor. And everything green down there that you can see is all multiflora rose. Now I'm gonna hope that this works. So what I'm doing now is I have some footage I'm gonna play and we're gonna see how well this comes through for you guys. So here is where I have begun my flight. I've taken off from a nearby parking lot and I am just flying over this really tight area. Now, part of the reason I'm being very careful here is because I can't fly a drone into a nature reserve. The law does not allow me to do that. And we've all probably seen a recent story about some birds being displaced by a drone flight. 
But what the drone does allow me to do in the area that I can fly is it gives me an ex extremely clear picture of what is going on in that forest understory. You can see the bare areas as I get closer to Wolf Cave, and then I skirt the edge of the preserve so I can look at a little bit more of the area where the rose is coming in. And as the drone passes over, and you can begin to see the trees move in that three-dimensional environment, you can really see the multi-floor rose pop out. You can see on one area, which is on, I believe, the north side of that road, has a lot more rose infestation. And then as we move a little bit east, you can see that that infestation has spread a little bit past part of the road and walkway that exists there. Um, I actually have been getting into lots of ways to use my drone to help scout for invasive species. And I'm actually using it right now to look at bush honeysuckle and multiflora rose and one of the fairgrounds that I work at. And I hope to continue this practice because I think this just produces a really interesting way of looking at this plant and getting an understanding of how far it's spread. And I wanted to let all of you know that most likely you live in close proximity to an extension educator who is also a licensed pilot. And they can come out to your property or area that you're concerned about and help you with this and maybe do a flight overhead. All right, so let's go ahead and pause. Oop, I guess we're about to finish the flight here. This is me actually flying over back to, you can see me there in the bottom left with my remote getting ready to land. All right, so moving on. I've zoomed in a little bit here. These are some of the still images that I've taken. And I just want to give kind of an idea of why the multiflora rose has spread so badly through McCormick's Creek. And what you're looking at right now is the circled area of where the rose is developing. And what I wanted to point out is that it's taking advantage of the openings in the canopy. Most likely no trees are going to develop there because the rose is invaded and it's just soaking up all of that sunlight because of the opening. Uh, a lot of timber stand improvement involves opening up canopies so different species can begin to grow. And unfortunately, it has the downside that uh, openings in that canopy makes an opening for the invasive species as well. The other thing to consider here too is that the trees haven't leafed out yet. So this plant develops earlier because it's taking advantage of the timing. It's hardy enough to be able to survive the cooler temperatures in early spring and it's just soaking up all that sunlight before the leaves really start to come out. And then it has those really strong rose hips so it can get through the winter. So they're going to be ready to go as soon as it starts warming up, making this a really terrible combination for something to see in an invasive species. All right, so let's talk a little bit about some control options that you guys can look into. I genuinely wish I had some better news for you here. Those of you who have worked with multiflora rose probably know what I'm talking about. Um, this plant's defenses and its natural ways of developing make it extremely resilient. Um, mechanical control is one option. Chemical control is another option. But the trouble is, is that this plant is challenging on an individual level and a landscape scale. Individual plants have to be removed entirely, and if it's on a landscape scale, you're looking at a dense thicket that can with a seed bank that can persist from decades. And it can just block out entire areas. That's why we use the drone in McCormick's Creek, because they couldn't simply walk through those areas to get an idea where the infestation was. Thankfully, we had access to our drone to help them out. So let's talk a little bit about mechanical removal. You can do this. Individual plants in a light infestation or early on can be removed by hand. But the key here is you need to remove them entirely. You must get the root system. The plants can develop back from the root system. And then if you're looking at a heavy infestation with dense thickets, you have very little choice but to use equipment designed to help tear up those plants and cut them out and remove them. And that can be a lot of backbreaking labor. Um, when we were talking with the naturalist at McCormick's Creek, they specifically hired on a seasonal naturalist who specialized in the removal of these species. That's all they did and all they will continue to do throughout the summer. Um, thankfully, they've done some great work at the state park and they've make, made a lot of headway. A lot of the multiflora rose is now gone, so they are just cornering it in the few pockets where it remains. Chemical removal is possible. 
Um, I know a lot of people who special, specialize in working with invasive species who will use different chemicals to remove them. Glyphosate and triclopyr are perhaps the most common herbicides used with this, though metsulfuron methyl is another one that's possible. And you will find a lot of products that are labeled for multiflora rows. Um, if I listed them here, it would take up a huge portion of the presentation. The best thing to do is if you're considering just spraying these plants, is you need to mow or cut them before you use any kind of application. The reason for this is, is that you wanna reduce that surface area and basically you wanna damage those plants. You want to stress them. Um, at my many garden programs that I've done this year, I've talked about how stress and wounds can ruin a garden. In this case, you wanna turn that to your advantage. You want these things to be injured so that way they're open more to being, a, to being killed by these chemicals. The important thing is that when you make an application, you want to keep your timing in mind. There are certain times of the year where it's going to work better and that sometimes where it's not going to work as well. So if you choose to go ahead and make foliar treatments on these plants, which is entirely possible, that means that you're doing it during the growing season. Foliar treatments can be effective, but you could have a serious impact on localized vegetation that you don't want to hurt. So when we were looking at the example of McCormick's Creek there, they had to be very careful with their timing because they didn't want to accidentally kill a massive hardwood plot that they've been trying to enhance and husband throughout the woods. Cut stump, stem, and basal bark treatments can be done at any time of year. This is the great part of this. They can be done at any time, doesn't matter when, you just want to make sure that whatever uh, chemicals you use, you have to make sure that you're using the correct, correct medium. So some of them are going to recommend some kind of oil medium that's going to be the carrier for the active ingredient. Some of them are going to use water. If you use one that is using water, that means that you're gonna be cutting that stump and you are immediately treating it. If you use oil, that means you can cut the stump and then you can wait a little bit. You don't want to wait too much longer, but you can wait a little bit and then uh, go ahead and do your treatment because the oil will be able to survive and get into the plant much easier if time has gone by where the plant's vascular system may have shifted directions because you cut into it now. Okay, this is my favorite goat picture, but I'm showing it for a reason. There is some evidence that shows that goats can help control multiflora rows they will consume it in woodlots. They'll consume a lot of different plants that are going to be on the forest uh, understory, but they have been shown to be fairly effective at controlling multiflora rows. And there are some indications that they can assist with bush honeysuckle as well. So for those of you who have neighbors who have goats, this is something you might consider if you don't necessarily have the time or energy to be there immediately. These little guys will clean up um, plants very, very quickly and very, very easily. All right, so that is what I have for everyone this evening. So I've got my contact information on there if you want access to me to ask me questions uh, or to bring me plant pictures or any number of things. I also have uh, links there to the Purdue Ed Store to get publications on a variety of plants and animals, as well as a link to our plant and pest diagnostic lab who can help diagnose diseases and other issues. Uh, with that, I'm gonna go ahead